result. If you believe some news outlets, it'll cure you of sunstroke, diabetes, and cystic fibrosis. If you believe others, it'll kill you. My personal recommendation is that you, night, that you take a nice, healthy pinch of it when you're reading your next health news headline. Of course, you guys listening to this are probably very good at sorting the decent health news from the questionable. You're most likely engaged and science literate, and so sometimes this stuff feels like common sense. This is what we call selection bias. You're not a random sample of the population. But for others throughout Australia, the majority of the population, it's not necessarily common sense. Consciously or unconsciously, people are making health decisions based on what they're getting from the news or on social media. Now, in this day and age, journalists like me are only part of a huge variety of sources of this information. But we're an important part. So when we're communicating these results to the public, it's important that we're not skewing them, or in some cases, completely skewering them. There are so many stops on the journey between scientists doing important research and the everyday person getting the message. There's the scientists themselves in how they design their experiments and then interpret the results. And that's why we have the peer review process. It's not infallible, but it's robust. If something's been published in a peer-reviewed journal, at least it's been checked by another scientist or two. But after that point, we've got communications people who work for universities or institutes or journals who are trying to make that research exciting and appealing to the public. Getting those messages right is so important. It's easy to accuse the media of being sensationalist or laugh at people who believe outrageous health claims. But sometimes, sometimes, these problematic messages actually come from the original press release itself. A British study a few years ago found 40% of university media releases contained health advice that was more hyped up than anything that appeared in the actual research article. So then, yes, those messages get fed to journalists who put their own misguided, sometimes, sometimes problematic or overly simplistic spin on them. In my own experience as a journalist who's always been interested in health and science, I've been amazed at people who I've worked with smart, savvy journalists who know a lot about really important subjects like politics and international relations, who shy away from science because they're intimidated by it or they just don't understand it. And these are often the people who end up being in charge of translating that science to the public. Part of the solution here is making sure that journalists are taught about health and science literacy, and another part is about investing in specialist reporters, something I obviously have a vested interest in. <laughs> But increasingly, another link in this long chain from the paper to the public is social media and the power of the internet for people to self-publish. No longer are mass media and specialist publications the privileged dominant sources of this information. Research institutes and journals have greater reach online, and so do people doing dodgy or questionably designed research. And you can't move two mouse scrolls on the internet without falling over a new self-styled wellness expert with a blog spruiking their own brand of supplements. Any one of the links in this chain can result in the public getting a garbled and potentially damaging message. So the question is, how do we fix it? We in the communication chain can begin by taking responsibility for the message in our own patches. And another important step is encouraging people to read between the lines with health news, no matter where they're getting it from. So what should you look for the next time you read an article or hear a radio spot telling you soy sauce causes cancer? A healthy skepticism is a good place to start. And let me propose a by no means exhaustive list of litmus tests we can apply to see how seriously we need to take these often contradictory health claims. Firstly, we should be encouraging people to ask that playground retort. Who says? Who's put out this study? And who's paid for it? Do they have vested interests? Are they a supplement manufacturer or a pharmaceutical brand publishing a survey that they've run that happens to put their research in a positive light? Or are they a research institution with funding coming through a transparent process, such as via the National Health and Medical Research Council? Where's the study been published? Is it just a press release? Is it a conference presentation on research that's still underway? Or are we looking at something that's been published in a high-quality academic journal after a peer review process? We can also ask questions about what was actually measured. Did the study measure what the headline, right, the headline is claiming as the link, or is the headline writer extrapolating? Let's say there was a study that looked at the effects of vitamin D on the incidence of cardiovascular disease in rats. It's important research and a good story until someone in the communication chain decides to get creative and runs with something like, pick up those oranges and you'll never have a heart attack. <laughs> then we should discuss where this stuff was measured. Was it in a petri dish, 
in animals like mice or in a nice, big, representative study of human beings. In vitro studies, which literally means in glass, and animal studies are important and informative, but we need to make sure we're not overstating the evidence. And readers need to know to look for this information. We don't want a reprise of pregnant women being basically encouraged to eat more Vegemite, because a study into birth defects found that when a handful of specific mutations were recreated in mice, the defects could then be prevented by making sure the mouse mums weren't deficient in a chemical called NAD, which can be made from beef three, which is in Vegemite. <laughs> a long bow to draw. And this actually happened last year, and it was an important study. But the implications for humans were oversold by many media outlets, including the ABC. So looking at sample size is important, looking at sampling methods is important, and perhaps most important of all for readers is looking for those hedging words, linked to, could cause. It's rare that a single study ever proves something definitively. Even a robust meta-analysis, which stacks up multiple individual studies to, start to try to see where the balance of evidence lies, is just that. It's a weighing of evidence. It's not cast iron proof. Especially when it comes to health issues, there are so many factors at play, it's virtually impossible to say for sure that one thing causes the other. And just because it looks like there's a link between two things doesn't necessarily mean one causes the other. As that weary science chant goes, correlation does not imply causation. I can show you a chart with very strong correlation between US per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who died from being entangled in their bed sheets. <laughs> it's, the chart is very pretty, but I'm yet to see any other evidence that shows that one of these things causes the other. Now, if there are a double-blind double blind randomized controlled trial that gave one big group of people lots of cheese and another group, big group of people no cheese, and like the cheese eaters all died, then maybe we could draw that conclusion. That would be a really interesting story. <laughs> these are the sort of questions we need to be asking. Here are some more questions. What's the dose? Too much fluoride will kill you. Just enough will keep your pearly whites pearly and white. What's the delivery method? Something that's rubbed on your skin might do you some good there, but it's not going to do you any good if you swallow it. And when we talk about risk, what does that mean in real terms? Tripled risk might just still mean that you've only got like a 3 in 100,000 chance of getting something versus a 1 in 100,000 chance. Science communicators should be answering these questions in the stories we produce, and savvy readers should be asking for the answers when they're not there. Not every science and health story worth telling will answer all these questions. And even if a story does tick the boxes, it's got a good sample size, meaningful results, it's a double-blind, randomized, controlled trial, we journalists are still not going to be able to cover, cover them all. But equipping people to ask the right questions can help readers start to spot red flags. Getting people to understand health research is important. People make health decisions based on what they're gleaning from these stories in the news. We know this because they tell us. And a long-time listener of The Health Report emailed us to say he recognised the symptoms of his heart attack because of information that was on the radio show, information that likely saved his life. And once research is in the public sphere, it gets recirculated again and again. You still see news about vaccines causing autism years after that research was debunked. And those things that capture the public imagination are often drivers for policy change, as we're seeing now around calls for a sugar tax. So getting the right messages out can be powerful. To do this, we need good science communicators at the institute level, good specialist reporters in the media, and more conversations like these. That way, we can help empower everyone to be more curious, skeptical, and science literate readers, minimal salt pinching required. <laughs> Uh, she lost me there for a moment when she slagged off the great Vegemite uh, study. I spent a lot of time on that headline.